Hello and welcome to Something Rhymes with Purple, the podcast about words and language and the very fact that something does rhyme with purple despite all expectations and insistences to the contrary. I'm Susie Dent and with me as always is the fabulous Giles Brandreth. Good to be with you again. Just remind us what word does rhyme with purple for people who are joining the podcast for the first time. Well, there's more than one, in fact. I can think of two to start with. One is um, herple, which we often talk about on here, don't we? To herple is to walk with a limp, to hobble, a dialect word. Um, And there is another one which is part of a horse's rump, and that is kerple, C-U-R-P-L-E. Herple is spelled H-I-R-P-L-E. So there's two for starters. And if you want to join the purple people, and I'm happy to say there are thousands of purple people around the world, because this is a global podcast and you think you've come up with another word that rhymes with purple that we don't know about do let us know you can communicate via email purple at something else.com and that's something spelt without a g oh gosh the magic of being able to communicate in this way online via the internet on Zoom, etc., is extraordinary I mentioned the word magic there when you were a little girl Did you love magic? Did you learn magic tricks? Did you do magic? Yes, I was one of many, many people who, as children, uh, received, well, as a child, received a magic kit. And I still remember the little plastic thimbles and the little foam balls that you put underneath, the decks of cards, the magician's hat, the wand, all of that. Um, I got it from Hamley's, the best toy shop in the world on London's Regent Street. And I was absolutely delighted, um, I have to say. I absolutely loved it. But, you know, we've talked in the past about how I am slightly coulrophobic. I'm slightly scared of clowns. I have to say that at parties, at friends' birthday parties, I would still be quite scared of the magicians who came to perform. I also also used to feel very sorry for the rabbits and the doves that were kind of stuffed into top hats. So it was a slightly mixed experience for me. I think I preferred reading a book, as always, and learning how to do the magic tricks myself. Well, I loved magic too. Interestingly, lots of surveys showing this, boys are much more into magic than girls. Mm. If you go to a magic show, I remember taking my son when he was sort of eight or nine to see Paul Daniels in Mm -hmm. the Dominion Theatre in the West End. And two-thirds of the audience was dads, granddads, and sons and grandsons. Only a third of the people there were female. Did you watch television magic? Did you ever go to see magic shows? Um, Yes, I remember Paul Daniels very well. And I have to say, on Countdown, we regularly have the brilliant street magician called Paul Zenon, Mm. who is wonderful and who... Is he's got incredible sleight of hand or prestidigitation, which means nimble fingered, if you remember. But he is absolutely against the, um, you know, the idea that kind of magicians have this sort of special superstitious magic or that psychics have this kind of special power. It is street magic for him. It is a simple way of fooling the public, as uh, magicians like he have or like him have done for centuries. Well, I've known a lot of magicians over my lifetime and I've written a number of magic books to prove it to you. Oh, I'm wow. speaking to Susie from my basement book room and hmm. I've just from the shelves, I mean, I've written a dozen magic books. Here is one of the ones I wrote. I'm, I'm holding it up to the screen so she can see it. The Beaver Book of Magic by Giles Brandreth. Ye, written, I don't know, about 30, 40 years ago when my children were tiny. I also wrote a biography of the great Houdini. Look at that. Who was hugely famous, probably the maybe one of the world's first globally famous uh, men of magic. And I've even written written some fiction. Look, Max, the boy who made a million, that's a little novel all about. And there's me, my fantasy picture of myself, dressed as a magician when I was a little boy. And That it, it, is incredible. I had no idea you'd written so many books about magic. And, of course, Paul, who I just mentioned, is also a huge aficionado and, and um, expert on, on Houdini, so you two could talk for hours about escapology and all that well, sort of thing. I got into a lot of trouble publishing the Houdini book because I revealed some of his secrets. They were secrets oh. that he had revealed in his lifetime. But right. the people from the magic circle got onto me and said, how could you, how could you? I was defended by my friend Ali Bongo. Did you mm-hmm. ever come across Ali Bongo? The most lovely man in the world. He was a magician yeah. himself, but he also advised some of the great magicians. He helped set up tricks for people like Paul Daniels on TV. And uh, Ali Bongo, if ever you phoned him, his answering machine, this is what it said. This is Ali Bongo. The answer is yes. Now, what's the question? 
He was just a powerhouse of positivity. Who are your favourite magicians? Do you know what? I don't... I, I love Darren Brown, who, of course, is, I think, a mentalist, really, rather than a magician as such. I mean, he is extraordinary. And what I love about him... Well, first of all, he's incredibly... He's an incredibly brilliant writer, um, really articulate, really pithy in the way that he gets quite complicated ideas about you know, subliminal persuasion and trance induction and mass hypnosis. You know, how he gets that across is quite incredible. But I love the way that actually he will deceive the audience, I mean, in such a compelling way where you just think this has to be magic. And then he will actually unpick it for you and say, this is how I did it. And it is all about that subliminal persuasion. And these incredibly complicated but effective verbal cues that he has planted all the way through his show. I mean, it's incredible. So from a purely ling linguistic point of view, I love Darren Brown. I think I would choose him as, as my one of my favourites. Well, we're going to talk about the language of magic, because that's what we talk about. Language in itself is magic. I don't quite know how it works. The other day I watched on television a production of The Winter's Tale from the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford-upon-Avon, and it was a production that they'd prepared, but the night it was due to open, literally, the pandemic you know, was declared. So they'd sort of kept it on ice for a year, and then they filmed it, and they showed it. And three quarters of the way through it, the magic happened. It's actually a show in which magic features, as it often does in Shakespeare. But the magic happened, I mean, there was a kind of emotional moment and you found your eyes pricking with tears. And I thought, this is just being done with words. It's just people yeah. speaking words and words written 400 years ago and they're working a magic and that is extraordinary. And I, in a way, almost don't want to know how these things are done. When a magician explains how the trick worked, I think, oh, well, now I know how it's done. It doesn't seem so remarkable. As you will know, because I'm sure I've told you about uh, meeting Michael Jackson. I met Michael Jackson because he was a friend of Yuri Geller. And ah. I, I'm a friend of Yuri Geller. Uh, I've got very little cutlery that hasn't been bent at least once by Uri. He very kindly then bends it back into shape when he goes home, having had supper. Is this for real? Does this he is for really real. do that? Oh, he really does do it. He really does it. And he's happy to do it. What's great about Uri is he's happy to do it as a party piece. And, um, you know, if he's with people... So what is it? What's going on? You have, to, you have to unravel this for me. No, I don't know what is going on. I've had a go at doing it myself, and I can do it in a tricksy way. Point. I can I can actually do it, but but my way of doing it is sleight of hand, and he manages to do it remotely. I do not know how it happens. Remotely. He, he, yes, he can actually give you a spoon that seems to be a straight spoon. You put it in your saucer. A moment later, he says, "Oh, what's happened to your spoon?" And you pick it up, and oh, it's bent slightly. You then hand it back to him, and it bends even more. But it did bend slightly. It seems. In mm. your saucer. Now, I wonder if that is, is, again, whether it's kind of all subliminal. I don't know. We don't know. That's that's the... You see, I think once you take the mystery out of magic, it's no longer magic. It suddenly becomes banal. Can we begin to explore some of these words? I'm sure we've touched on before the word magic. Where does that come from? Magi, as in the journey yes. of the Magi, all that sort of yes, thing? Yes, absolutely. So um, Persian priests, the Magi, who were, you know, skilled in enchantment and also considered incredibly wise so actually you have to remember that wizard has at its heart wise as well a wizard was a wise man um just a reminder that if people want to know more about witches and wizardry we did cover that didn't we in the episode gobelinus but yes the magi their roots possibly may go back to a really ancient word meaning to have power so you know that's at the heart of machine and all sorts of things so that's quite possibly its um ultimate origin but if People say that prostitution is the oldest profession, or as that's what the saying will tell you. Magicians might argue otherwise, because the cup and balls routine, which I think we mentioned in our last um, episode, and which you'll still see, won't you? Um, and, you know, not just in kids' magic sets, but also the street performers' repertoire often includes the, the cup and balls routine. That was a favourite even for the ancient Greeks. And it was one of the tricks played by the Acetabulari, they were called, a group of musicians who took their name from the small vinegar cups, the acetic acid cups that they used for it. So incredibly old. And the tricks with thimble as well, called the thimble rig trick, um, rig is a swindle, that also goes back to those early magic makers. So it's incredibly old. Let me stop you on the word trick, 
Where does that come from, mm. T-R-I-C-K? Okay, so trick goes back to, that's a Latin word, that goes back to um, tricare or tricari, really, and that means to be evasive. So, of course, it's, again, all about the sleight of hand. So, yeah, that's where that comes from. I think it also had another meaning of shuffle, so, of course, that would lead you into the kind of card-playing tricks as well. One of my favourites always was Tommy Cooper, who uh, pretended that it was all going wrong, he didn't know what he was doing, but was precise Um, He absolutely knew what he was doing. And you'd have thought, well, he's a shambles. But in fact, he understood the mechanics, the nuts and bolts of it all. Can you take us into the, the world of some of the language of the nuts and bolts of it? Yeah, well, so shall I start with the words spoken by the magicians themselves? Yes. So they're patter. So patter is quite interesting um, in itself. So that was a word that began as a shortening of pater noster, the Lord's Prayer. And it was um, referring really to the rapid mumbling of prayers. And then patter itself grew from that and around the 18th century. And it was um, originally part of the, the cant language, as it was called, of thieves and beggars in the criminal underworld. Then you've got the magical... And does that include, I mean, forgive me, things mm. like abracadabra, mm. hey presto, um, yeah. Izzy Wizzy, let's get busy. I'm giving yes. away my generation now. <laughs> Izzy Wizzy. Izzy, Izzy I've not Wizzy. Heard that, that was one. that was Sooty. Sooty, who was a magician. Oh, Did you I remember, remember Sooty. That? Yeah, yeah. And I've got in my teddy bear collection at Newby Hall in North Yorkshire the original Sooty belonging to Harry Corbett from the 1940s. Oh, and if I you look at saying, his yeah. on the on the pads on his paws, you can see the glue marks where the wand was attached to the pad so that the wand didn't come off um, Uh, when he was whizzing it. Izzy, whizzy, let's get busy. Anyway. okay. I can't tell you where that one comes from, but I can tell you about Hey Presto and Abracadabra. So Hey Presto began as Hey Presto Be Gone, and it possibly was part of the kind of, you know, presto, obviously, the idea of of rapidity, again, prestidigitation, rapid fingers. But it's kind of also similar to hocus pocus. Um, And that was the opening of a string of mock Latin that was used by jugglers in the 17th century. So you have to go back to fairs and markets and the charlatans there. Um, So hocus pocus was, as I say, part of this kind of random made up Latin to make it sound incredibly authentic. Um, So that's hey presto. And then abracadabra was said to be part of a spell that had special powers against fatal diseases and other things. It was used as an amulet, if you like, to ward off evil. And in fact, you did sometimes find the arrangement of the letters um, on an amulet amulet to, um, you know, to send away the evil eye. Remind me what an amulet is. So an amulet is like a talisman, really. Is it a physical thing? It's a physical thing, like a sort of, you could have it as a necklace, for example, and some of them would bear the word abracadabra written in a triangular pattern. So you'd have A, sorry, you'd have abracadabra at the top and then abracadabra without the A and so on and so on until the last bottom bit of the triangle was simply an A. So you will find that too. So that's that's the kind of patter, which I think is quite interesting. And then as always, you've got the tribal vocabulary. You've got the vocabulary used magician to magician, perhaps within the magic circle to describe their repertoire. So you've got a profond. Can you guess what that is? Because your French is quite good. Profond, something profond. deep, something that's the back. Exactly. So it's a large pocket in tailcoats where Uh, the magician basically can can have, you know, he can use it for what's called vanishes. So vanishes used as a noun or or the productions as they call them. A lot of it is optical illusion. So that somebody is wearing a coat with these deep pockets and it's a black silk coat against a black background. It doesn't look as profound as it is. Just as when you're sawing the lady in half or whoever you're sawing in half, it used to be a lady, it's the, the, the stripes on the side of the table give you the impression that the table is less deep than it is, so Uh that when the body is inside, it can actually go lower than you're thinking. It's going more profound. And and similarly, when you're putting... Somebody goes into a a box standing up and you put swords through the front, through the side, from the top, the bottom, all, all of that. But they're so brilliant, these magicians, they've come up with new and different ways of doing that. So what, we're not giving away very much saying that because because they, they, can imp- they can improve on that. They really can. Uh, always. Um, you've got the gimmick, of course, and gimmick has a special meaning in, in magic. It's a small object 
or piece of equipment which enables the magic and which the audience is entirely unaware of. Oh. And the gimmick itself, we think, is a sort of fuzzy amogram, anagram of magic. Um, we think that's where Good. gimmick really? comes from. Mm. Really? Yeah. And is that the same gimmick as we talk, what's your gimmick when you say that to somebody? Yeah. You've got a special idea. Okay, what's the special gimmick? Exactly. It's the same word. It's the same word. So the original sense was a piece of magician's apparatus and then it came to mean any trick or device that's kind of intended to attract attention Gosh. if you like oh and just another word that we've got from magic actually i can't remember if we talked about this i think we did because i remember saying that nick hewer was actually taken in by this in london a phony phony goes back to what was known as a fawny rig remember again that the rig bit means a, a swindle it's quite complicated but the thief if you like drops a ring which is brass but actually looks gold and very expensive. So I'm, I'm using he, it could be a she, but he drops it before an unsuspecting person comes along. The unsuspecting person finds it and they say, oh, have you dropped your ring? And the other person says, oh, no, no, it's, it's not mine. And they have this sort of pleasant conversation as to who should take it because it's obviously worth something and the magician if you like or the trickster will then say look don't worry honestly you take it you can give me a tenner if you like for my trouble and that's what they do and then you know which nick gladly gave over only to discover when he took it to jewelers that actually it was worth absolutely nothing because it was made of brass mm. and the irish for a ring is fonne i think f-a-i-n-n-e my irish pronunciation is legendary for its terribleness um but that means a ring in irish and um that gave us fawny so it was the fawny rig and eventually that became phony because of course the essence of all this the essence of magic particularly magic shows is that it is trickery it is phony uh, do you remember somebody called Huey Green? Do you remember a programme called Opportunity Knox? Opportunity Knox. I remember that when I was really little, yeah. Well, when you were really little... And there was little, a clapometer. I appeared on Opportunity Knox, not oh. as a performer, but they used to have people sponsoring you. If you were an act, somebody came on to sponsor you. And back, I think, almost 50 years ago, I appeared on Opportunity Knox, sponsoring the daughter of Cyril Fletcher, who was an entertainer, Jilly Fletcher, and she was a young magician. And I introduced her, and then she was she did a trick involving putting your head in a kind of stocks and then having it a kind of guillotine, you know, where the blade comes down. And to try it, she put in a cabbage in the guillotine and then let the guillotine come down, and the cabbage was cut in half. Anyway, the idea was then that you put your head in and your head was cut in half. Uh, the point is, at the rehearsal... In her nervous state, she forgot to flick the right switch and just at the last minute realised that actually she could have cut my head or Huey Green's head off. Oh Many my goodness. people might think that could have been a good thing. <laughs> uh, I'd forgotten that completely. And then I saw a recent television programme about Tommy Cooper. And Tommy Cooper did this same trick for a Michael Parkinson Christmas show one year. And he, Tommy Cooper, also forgot to flick the switch which held the blade back. Surely health and safety these days would never allow no, this, would they? Fortunately, one of the floor managers realised what had happened oh and, as it were, when the camera was looking at Michael Parkinson, he nipped up onto the set and flicked the switch <sighs> so that, in fact, Michael Parkinson's head was not cut off. So you, you run risks in this world. So a gimmick is a gimmick. Woofle dust. I love woofle dust. Oh, yes, dust. woofle dust. Is, is that a word, a word phrase from the world of magic? Yes, it's just a kind of invisible substance, a dust that makes tricks work, but obviously it's an excuse for secretly picking up an object or getting rid of one. So the magician will say, I'll oh, just, you know, just put some woofle dust on. You'll find kids entertainers doing that all the time, which is lovely. And what else have we got? Levitation. Now, that's one I can never understand. Levitation, where again, you know, they, the, the magician will have a person rise up into the air and they will put their hands underneath them to show that there is nothing propping them up. I have no idea about that. I'm guessing, I, well, actually, let's not guess. Let's let's not expose it. But that that I find incredible. And um, that goes back to the Latin levitas, meaning lightness, which is, of course, where we also get levity from. I'm showing oh, you got an pictures. illustration from my book, The Magic of Houdini, uh, because that slightly illustrates how how ah. it can be done, uh, the levitation. It's often done with... In fact, you, you, you see it if you see... If you go to a market 
and you see people standing still for hours on end, apparently levitating. Have you seen that? It's all to do with metal rods going up, and the way they do that is they they appear to take your their hoop right the way across the metal yeah. rod underneath, but in fact they aren't. There are little gaps here and there where uh, and it's the way they, they twist uh. their hands. The reason I was never any good at a magician is that it requires so much practice, practice, practice. If you want to do it, you've really got to work at it. And, and risk killing someone in the interim. Yeah, of course, because there's nothing fun in life without danger. Jeopardy. Uh, jeopardy. Walking the tightrope, falling off it. Before we take our break, have you got any more words from the technical world of magic? Well, maybe we should end with fake, because fake obviously has been in the news massively, hasn't it? Thanks to fake news and accusations of that for the last decade, probably. So fake in magic, it's kind of spelled F E. K-E. You'll often find that within tribal vocabulary, there's a slightly different spelling again to sort of make it the group's own. Now, a fake is an item in magic which looks like a regular everyday object, but it's been gimmicked to facilitate the trick. So it might be a drinking glass with the bottom removed. It might be a coin which has got a magnet somehow in it. That's the fake in magic. But the fake as we use it, which of course is related, is we know London criminal slang arose in the 18th century, meaning counterfeit uh, or a swindle, but it probably goes back a long, long way. Um, and it might be related to a German word, fegen, meaning to sweep or to clear out or to plunder. So perhaps again, the idea of daylight robbery, actually somebody coming along and, and um, picking a pocket or two or whatever. So lots of different theories actually for fake and, and given that it's such a unfortunately everyday word now um you know work still goes on to uncover it which i suppose is quite appropriate really isn't it because there are probably lots of fake stories attached to it too mm, intriguing that's the world of magic according to susie dent this is something rhymes with purple Welcome back to Something Rhymes with Purple. We're talking magic and magicians, and one of the best, James Randi, famously said, magicians are the most honest people in the world. They tell you they're going to fool you, and then they do. It's amazing what magicians can do, what mind readers can do, what mesmerists can do. Mm. Now, mesmerism is one of those words that is named after a person. What are those words called? Uh, they are eponyms. Eponyms, exactly. Yes. Like Wellington boots, silhouette, leotard. Sandwiches. Tell me, <laughs> sandwiches, yes, exactly. <laughs> Tell me about mesmerism and where that comes from and what it is. Yeah, well, Franz Anton Mesmer was denounced in the 17th century Vienna as a, as a kind of practitioner of magic and pure and simple and nothing else. But actually, he... He believed himself to be a scientist, really, and he set out to um, show his, or to, to prove, I guess, the existence of a mysterious fluid that permeates all matter, which he called animal magnetism. And he made quite a name for himself in Paris. They moved from Vienna to Paris and he attracted the attention and support of the aristocracy, even the monarchy, in fact, including Marie Antoinette. And various contemporary accounts describe what became known as mesmerism. And this involved patients sitting in circles, holding hands around a large tub, get this, of sulfuric acid from which iron bars would kind of be sticking out. And these iron bars had previously been touched by Mesmer. And so he said they were imbued with animal magnetism. And the result, according to the people who went, were what they called crises of the body. And then came a total cure. So now, looking back, the idea we think is that this was all about psychosomatic relief, if you like, rather than obviously real medicine. And not everyone believed it at the time. So King Louis XVI, for example, he appointed a committee to investigate Mesmer and his claims. And it said that these cures were purely the result of mind persuasion rather than, you know, as I say, real medicine. Eventually, Mesmer fled Paris, the French Revolution came, and it was recognised that what he promoted was a trance-like, mesmerising state that then induced the mind to effect recovery. And when, in the 19th century, a Scottish surgeon called James Braid 
took the idea, if you like, and then turned to the name of the Greek god of sleep, Hypnos, to create the alternative term hypnotism, which was not too dissimilar. It was the idea of artificially inducing a trance as the way to recovery. So Mesmer kind of much lauded in his time, then much ridiculed. But, you know, as I say, his his kind of practices, if you like, have been built on with this idea of hypnotism these days. Have you ever been hypnotised, Giles? Sort of. I am a little bit by you. (laughs) Um, I think it's completely fascinating. I was a friend of the actor Richard Bryars, and Ah. Richard Bryars' hero was the great Victorian actor Sir Henry Irving in his day, the most famous actor probably in the world, and the first actor to be knighted in this country. And Richard Bryars, who studied Irving's story in detail, was convinced that Irving was a mesmerist because he said he physically was not particularly appealing, he had a slight speech impediment, and yet he managed to hold audiences, 2,000 people at a time, when doing his performances. And Richard was of the view that this was mesmerism, that it was, as it were, the power of hypnosis over an audience. Have you been hypnotised with a sort of swinging watch in front of you, making your focus? Not with a swinging watch, no. I have, as part of um, CBT, so cognitive behavioural therapy, I have been induced into a kind of hypnotic trance. But for me, it was it was not at all like the kind of dramas that you see where, you know, you, you suddenly just become awake but entranced. I just lightly dozed. This was purely, I should say, because I'm a worrier, as you know, and I'm so sick of worrying about stuff, I thought I'm actually going to get some help with this. So the idea was to try and kind of soothe my soul, if you like. And that it, it was it was quite effective, these again, in a subliminal a, way. These people have a gift. I know Paul McKenna, mm. and he's a very yeah. intuitive person. You're with him. And he, because of the sort of person he is, he quickly gets onto your wavelength, understands what you're about. But I have friends who've been to Paul McKenna professionally, and uh, he has cured them, for example, of smoking completely. Yeah, that's incredible, isn't it? But there is a kind of willingness, that if you want to be cured, yeah. you're yeah. making yourself susceptible to it, and he is introducing you to techniques that will enable you to help you know, give up what you want to do. So I think it is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, the, the power of the mind when it's led in the right way is both staggeringly, incredibly impressive, but also quite scary, I think. Just remind me about Hypnos. I have hosted the British Bedding Awards <laughs> and Hypnos Beds regularly win. And indeed, they make very comfortable beds. Yes. Including, I think, all the beds for the hotel chain that Lenny Henry advertises. Oh, yes. Anyway, yes, yes. Who was Hypnos? He was a Greek god, was he? Yes, so the god of sleep, um, so the Greek god of sleep, I think, whereas the Roman god of sleep was Morpheus, which is why we have morphine. Um, so that's where hypnos comes from. And, and again, because hypnotism induces this kind of trance-like sleepy state. So we've done hypnotism, we've done mesmerism. Have we done mentalism? Have we talked about mentalism? Um, mentalism actually is quite um, late on. So it only came about in the 19th century in the way that we know it today. So um, a mentalist is defined as a magician who, like Darren Bryan, who I mentioned earlier, performs feat that demonstrate extraordinary mental powers, such as mind reading. It's interesting the names these magicians give themselves. Mm. Uh, David Copperfield. Do you think that's his real name? Or has he taken the character Ooh. from Dickens? It, it makes the name more memorable. It's like there's an actress called Anne Hathaway. I realise yeah. now I'd have had a much more successful career if I'd called myself William Shakespeare. What a mistake to make her to call yourself Charles Brandreth when you could have been David Copfield or Oliver Twist. For our older listeners, I saw and loved a magician called David Nixon. He had a lot of charm, a great deal of charm, made it look terribly easy and he was sort of nonchalant about it. But we've been talking really about UK-centric people in the world of magic. If you are tuning in from the other side of the world, and happily thousands do, please let us know about magicians wherever you are. And uh, if there are terms of phrase that we don't know about, let us know. And if Izzy Wizzy, let's get busy, predates Sooty, I'd like to know that as well. We ought to do an episode on catchphrases, actually. Izzy Wizzy, let's get busy. Let's (laughs) do that next week. Okay. But right now, uh, people from around the world have been in touch, haven't they? What have they They been saying to us? They definitely have. 
Well, one of our very recent episodes was about um, advertising slogans that have stayed with us over the years. And lots and lots of purple people got in touch. Thank you so much. There were nods to Wrigley's gum, um, happy little Vegemites in Australia. I love Vegemite. And this one from Nikki in Worcester, which I think will resonate with lots of British listeners. Nikki says, hello, I've just been enjoying the edition of the podcast where you talked about advertising. The one that sticks in my mind is an advert from the 1970s. I can't remember what it was for, but it involved two young boys talking about football teams. All I remember is the last line, which was, Accrington Stanley, who are they? Uh, she says, if I ever hear Acton Stanley mentioned these days, I always have to say, who are they? Um, do you remember this? I used to love this ad. I don't, it definitely was in my day, and I think it was in the 80s for the milk marketing board. Do you mm, remember it? I do. Of course I remember it. So the implication was if you drank milk, you would be more likely to grow up and play for Liverpool. And if you didn't drink milk, then it was Accrington Stanley. Um, and sorry, it's a terrible, terrible Geordie accent or Liverpoolian accent. Sorry, and then <laughs> I can't even a get my Accring accent. I ought to explain that Accrington Stanley is actually <laughs> in Lancashire, but oh but yours... well, maybe I've got the accent completely wrong. Uh, no, no, I think you've got the accent right. But Accrington itself, just in case people think we don't know where Accrington is, my uh, grandfather lived in Accrington, and my great aunt was the head teacher of the local primary school there. Oh, well, it was also a pretty good football team, as I understand it. That's the point. People joke about Accrington Stanley, but in their day, they were pretty hot stuff. Yeah. And then when it's Accrington Stanley, who are they? The answer was exactly. <laughs> it was a brilliant ad. So thank you, Nikki, for reminding us of those. Um, have you got another one? I've got, well, we say we go global, we do. Good day from Down Under. Susie oh, yeah. and Giles, again, embarrassing form, accent from me. As a former <laughs> native of the fair city of Liverpool, my mother used a word when I was growing up in the 60s, which I don't believe was particularly scouse. This is from Ian, Gold Coast in Australia. The word he's mentioning is snooing, S-N-O-O-I-N-G, as in, don't play near that railway line, it's snooing with rats. Mm. Never heard the word since. Snooing. Have you ever come How across this How is Ian word? spelling snooing there? S for sugar, N for noddy, double O, as in double O seven, mm. I N G, snooing. Well, I have to say, Ian, that I think if you looked at uh, printed records of this, it is probably spelt snooing, S-N-E-W-I-N-G, ah. which was an alternative and regional past tense of snowing. And the idea is that, obviously, if you've got snow coming down, you've got precipitation, it's also the idea of teeming and, and sort of pouring. So it's snowing with rats would be then, it's it's snowing with rats, it's teeming with rats. And I'm pretty sure that's where that comes from, rather than the double O. But, you know, as so often happens with English spelling, it might well have changed over time. Jack Hughes is in touch. He comes from York. As ever, thank you so much for the tonic that is something rhymes with purple. We appreciate that. I, like Susie, am a Germanist and study history and German at university. I'm also a budding food writer. And as I was preparing a mushroom stroganoff, I started wondering about the origin of the word clove. I want to know the origin of the word mushroom. Never mind stroganoff. Anyway, uh, the origin of the word clove, referring to garlic, not the spice, but perhaps there is yeah. a further link to be made. Does a clove of garlic have anything to do with feet, as in cloven hooves? I thought the link might be there, that in German the word for toe is ze, Z-E-H, and a clove of garlic is a knoblauchze. Knoblauchze. Yes. Das, das ist gut. Take it away. <laughs> OK, so we probably have to start with two different types of clove in our cupboards at home, if we're quite fancy. So one on the spice rack in a jar and the other in a garlic bulb. Um, and they're two very different words. So the spice clove, famously used in apple pies, but also for toothache, and which I think is disgusting, comes from the French clou de girofle, which was nail of the clove tree. And you can see why, because cloves, the spice, they look a little bit like nails. And that clou de girofle actually gave us the jilly flower for the pink flower that actually has a similar sort of smell to clove. So that's the first one. Then the clove of garlic is an old English word, and that's related to cleave and to cloven, cloven hoofed. And the idea is split 
into more than one piece. So obviously, if you're looking at a garlic bulb, you can see that there are lots and lots of different garlic cloves within it. Uh, so that is the idea there. As for Knoblauchzi, the Knoblauch bit comes from the German Klieben, which also means to cleave, and Lauch meaning a leek. So they associated it as an L-E-E-K. So they associated it with a different vegetable altogether. And I don't know. I'm fascinated to know whether Tse uh, is related to Tseen and Tseer, uh, meaning a toe. I suspect it is, with the idea, again, of, of sort of having something which is slightly split into different parts. And it's absolutely fascinating. So thank you to Jack, because I'm going to, um, I'm going to turn to my German etymological dictionary and see whether toes are involved. Can you tell those of us who are sitting in the cheap seats um, <laughs> about, very quickly, mushroom and stroganoff, just oh, yeah. in a nutshell? Uh, so stroganoff is, I think, I'm going to look that up. I think stroganoff is an eponym. That's my guess. Um, and I may be guessing it. I think there was a great stroganoff. chef called... Oh, Count Stroganoff. Count Stroganoff, yeah. Was it made for him or by his chef? It, made, made I think by made, chef? For made, made for him. Made for because he was a diplomat. Yes, so Good. much as you've got Peach Melba, which was made for Dame Nellie Melba, and Margarita Pizza, which was for uh, Queen Marguerite, etc. So I think it was made for him. So mushroom is an example of how we like to take a foreign word, in this case the French muceron, which means a mushroom, and make it sound more English and something more comfortable on our tongues. So we decided we knew the words mush and we knew the, ro the word room. It doesn't matter if it makes absolutely no sense to appropriate this. It's similar to... Do you remember the Portuguese explorers giving the Spanish um, the avocado and they chose a word that didn't sound a bit like the Aztec ajuatl because they couldn't pronounce it. Uh, so they actually turned it to avocado, which meant a slister, but it didn't matter. It sounded like that. Same with the with the mushroom. Mousseron was hard for us, so we decided it sounded a bit like mushroom. That would do. Do you remember Shirley Conran? She said, life's too short to stuff a mushroom. I think I'm with her. I'm but with life her is not long enough to learn all the words that Susie Dent knows. Give us your trio for this week, Susie. Three interesting words that you feel should have greater currency. OK, so um, this is my first one. I don't think any of us really are going to use this particularly, but I just love it because it sounds so brilliant. It literally trips off the tongue. And it's a Nick Nakatarian. Oh, I like when it. When I say literally trips off the tongue, it's obviously not jumping off my tongue onto the desk, but Nick Nakatarian. Nick Nakatarian. I love it. What's and it that's mean? a dealer in knickknacks. Oh, very good. <laughs> I'm a Nick Nakatarian. Who sells I love little, it. Little trinkets. Trinkets and unconsidered trifles. Excellent. Exactly. Exactly. Um, then you've got, again, something that I chose for its sound, really, a flam foo. Now, a flam foo was originally a gaudily dressed female. So somebody who was only interested in her appearance and, mm -hmm. about, you know, she just wasn't interested in anything else really. But it, it's been later applied to anyone who is more froth than trousers or more mm -hmm. froth than substance, I should say. And I just love the sound of it. A flam, you're such a flam foo. And finally, um, I think we've all met one of these, a biblioclept. You can probably absolutely guess what that is. Somebody who steals books? Exactly. A book thief. A friend who borrows a book and never gives it back. They are a biblioclept. I can't bear them. It's why I've stopped lending books to people. I just won't do it anymore. Because then you forget who you've lent it to and it's just, it's hopeless, isn't it? Three words from you and a little bit of poetry Poetry. From me. Lovely. Because we've been talking about magic and I've been thinking about Shakespeare because it was his birthday the other day. Well, I say his birthday. We don't know when his birthday was. We do know he was baptised on the 26th of April, so we reckon his birthday might have been the 23rd. And that's when I saw the RSC production of The Winter's Tale, where, in fact, unconsidered trifles, I think that may be the first use of that turn of phrase that we know of. But magic occurs in a lot of Shakespeare's plays and... The Tempest, Prospero, is a magician, a man of magic, and he ends his reign as a magician with these wonderful words. Our revels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, who are all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, 
leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Beautiful. Oh, brings us right back to hypnosis. Well, I hope people haven't nodded off uh, listening to this because it, as always, means a huge amount to us that not only do you listen, but that you also get in touch. Um, so please do carry on getting in touch. We do read everything. Um, it's purple at somethingelse.com. Something Rhymes with Purple is a Something Else production produced by Lawrence Bassett with additional production from Harriet Wells, Steve Ackerman, Ella McLeod, Jay Beale, and, yes, the Prince of Flamfoo. Gully. Gully. <laughs>